to Steve and his committee for putting this wireless association plan together. For those of you that are on the committee, could you please stand and let everybody recognize you, please? I know there's a lot of people out there that helped with this. So if you are on the committee and helped with this, plan, Secondly, before I introduce our speaker, there was a set of keys found outside the front door of this building here, the convention center. It looks to be a rental car, Chevy Impala that's black. You can either stand up and come get them and be thoroughly embarrassed now, or you can come see me after the speech and be somewhat embarrassed. Oh, and, okay. And tell them not to close it. So a Chevy Impala, it looks to be a rental car, but there's no indication of the rental car company on here. So if you think those might be yours, just come by and take a look. Good boy. I want to give you a little background on our keynote speaker tonight. Jonathan Adelstein assumed the role of president and CEO of PCIA on September 17th. 2012, so I guess your six-month grace period is now officially over. He comes to PCIA after serving as the 17th Administrator of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Utility Service, a position for which he was nominated by President Obama and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate in July 2009. Jonathan previously served as Commissioner of the FCC from 2002 to 2009, so he's intimately involved with our industry. A lifelong public servant, Jonathan has dedicated his career to fighting for the public interest. As our U.S. Administrator, Jonathan oversaw a $60 billion portfolio of rural electric, water, and telecommunications infrastructure loans. As an FCC commissioner, Jonathan sought to secure access to communications for everyone, including, including those left behind by the market. Now, before joining the FCC, Jonathan held a number of senior staff positions in the U.S. Senate, including work for Alabama's own Senator Shelby, Arkansas's own Senator Pryor, and ultimately with Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle. Jonathan received an MA in History and a BA with Distinction in Political Science from Stanford University and is a graduate of Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. Jonathan was born and raised in Rapid City, South Dakota. I guess hence showing your allegiance to Senator Daschle. He currently lives with his wife Karen and two children in the Washington, D.C. area. We are very fortunate to have Jonathan heading up the PCIA uh, today, so if you would, please help me give Jonathan a warm welcome. Well, thank you so much, Andy, and thanks for all uh, that you do uh, for Alabama. And by the way, Andy, you left your keys behind up here. Uh, it's a black impala. <laughs> we know who it was now. Uh, we really appreciate all you do for Alabama and, and, and all the, the state presidents who are here from the 10 different states and everybody who did all the work to make this event possible. This is a fantastic event. I think it's a great example for all the different regions of the United States and what we can do in bringing the, the South together uh, to talk about what we do to move this industry forward. Of course, as uh, Andy uh, mentioned, a uh, little known fact, uh, I'm from the South too. South Dakota, it is now. In my part of the South, this is considered absolutely balmy. <laughs> We'd definitely be out golfing in this. Uh, but it's, it's amazing work that you do putting this together. You, you uh, have all these volunteers, you're, you're, you're doing this while doing important jobs, and I know uh, it's fortunate for all of us that we're very busy right now. The business is booming. Demand is booming, we're out there working, yet you find the time to make sure that, that you can work as a, as a state, as a, as a region, to move um, our agenda forward. So it's uh, great to work for folks like all of you. I feel like this is sort of my new, my new family here. Uh, 
having been on the FCC and RUS, I've looked at the entire landscape of the telecommunications uh, networks in the United States, and I really believe that we are in the most exciting and dynamic aspect of all of the telecommunications uh, issues. We are on the cutting edge of making sure that people can get the networks they need to get the broadband that they want. Consumers, businesses, uh, public safety, uh, it goes on and on. And, and we're the ones who are delivering that. So I'm really proud to work for all of you. It's something I can relate to personally. I come from a family of builders. Uh, back in, in South Dakota, my grandfather started a construction company back in 1925, building uh, roads and bridges. And his model was builders of better road, roads, bridges, highways, and structures. And that's kind of what I see as what you all do and what we are doing together uh, through BCIA, making sure that we build networks for the future. It was the highway system back in the 40s and 50s, and now it's uh, the, the broadband networks that we're building that connect America just as the highway system did before. And uh, I learned a lot about, about your region, uh, both in government, when I worked for, as, uh, as Andy mentioned, some senators from, from the South, from Senator, Senator Pryor. And I started my first job as an intern for Senator Shelby uh, from Alabama. And, uh, and all along, I, I learned about what it is that you do uh, and how difficult it is to get in the trenches and actually build this out and how many obstacles you run into. So I'm a longtime advocate in my current government of doing what you advocate for, which is expanding wireless broadband everywhere. I guess a short summary we do, we expand wireless broadband everywhere, not just by building it out in coverage, but by expanding, I mean capacity as well, where we're filling in where the carriers are seeing the need and the demand. Back at the FCC, a champion long before there was one, a national broadband plan, and uh, we've got one now. At, at the RUS oversaw loans and grants that uh, made sure that we made massive investments, $7 billion in, in infrastructure uh, for water. A lot of you know uh, the rural parts of the country that need better water systems that are falling apart, that were built back in the 30s in the last big economic downturn. And as President said, for this out downturn, we're gonna invest in infrastructure again, not just water and roads, but in broadband. For the first time, we were able to do a, a program recovery act to get broadband out, including including wireless. And those investments pay off. They not only created jobs at a time when this country badly needs them and needed them, but once these found once these uh, networks are built, they'll be the foundation for economic growth and job creation for years to come. So this industry is is doing well, uh, and I think the reason why is that people want this. So when we talk about what we do, I think as you go out and you advocate uh, for better zoning, for better siting practices, rather than talk about antennas or towers or the things that make it possible, what I like to talk about is the things that we enable. What it's really all about, what consumers care about. They care about the fact that wireless is essential to economic growth, to small businesses that have new markets, to new job creation. Uh, we talk about the healthcare opportunities and the educational opportunities uh, and the cultural opportunities and the opportunity for public safety to be able to connect with wireless broadband anywhere. Uh, the ability for businesses to innovate. That's what we really enable. Nobody gets very excited about towers or antennas, except for us, of course. We get very excited about them. Uh, but what the public gets is that if you explain, you can't have all those things that you love about wireless broadband. You can't have it with you in your hand anywhere you go. And you're going to see that circle going on and on, waiting to download whatever it is you need. And it may be more urgent than just seeing what the latest uh, is on on some uh, some cat that learned how to use the toilet. You know, it might be somebody who's going into a burning building who's going to be able to download the blueprints for that building. Going in there, our first responders, and knowing where. This, the, the points are that they need to watch out for as they're going in. And these are the networks that we're building together. And, and uh, we need to meet these exploding demands. We're studying at PCI. As soon as I got there, I said, we've got to launch a study to see what are the demands for wireless broadband versus the capacity that we have. And we're going to get that study back here shortly. We're seeing the early returns. And the result is that it's, it's, it's a big uh, demand. 
And I, I saw firsthand a lot of the benefits of this. Uh, I was over at the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, uh, and we talked about the benefits of wireless uh, machine to machine uh, in agricultural applications. Just one example that people don't think about much, but coming from a rural part of the country, uh, the impact is really incredible. Uh, with additional, better, more reliable wireless infrastructure, farming equipment can operate down to one inch or even less accuracy. And what does that mean? I mean, that means that we're going to improve both um, both the input and the yield. That can be its whole savings of 14 billion annually in the ag sector alone. And I could go on and on about each other sector of the economy that we are contributing that much in terms of their ability to produce efficiently uh, for the economy. And the work that you're doing, I think, building out these broadband networks carries the same transformational importance that that highway network that my grandfather helped to build, or the rural electric networks that the rural utility service helped to build. So what we're doing is, is really uh, critical for the future of this country. Uh, people talk about the fact that there's a spectrum crunch. You might have heard that term. The current chairman uh, of the FCC has talked about it, others have talked about it, and there certainly is a spectrum crunch. There's a need for more spectrum. But I like to think of it a different way. I like to think of it as a wireless data crunch. You go out and you talk to consumers or businesses, they don't want spectrum. They want data, and they want it fast over their wireless connection wherever they go. So what does that take? Well, there's a number of ways that you can get them the data they want. Spectrum is one of the key ways to do it, so we support as much new spectrum that we can get online as quickly as possible. But another way of doing it is network improvements, 4G, for example. Vastly increases the efficiencies in these networks, and so you, you can do more with the same amount of spectrum. The third element, which you all do every day, is infrastructure. With or without new spectrum, you can provide more wireless data if you build more infrastructure, called infill, densification, call it what you will. It means you're taking the same spectrum and you're using it more, reusing it, so that you can get more over the same existing spectrum because we're not creating any more spectrum. And uh, we are uh, excited to help your companies grow because you're in an awesome position to make that happen, given that you are one of the solutions, one of the key solutions to this because we're finding in Washington real battles over finding additional spectrum. There's just not a lot that's readily available. And so we've heard policymakers get this. Um, we're spreading the message, of course, at PCIA about the importance of these wireless networks and working at a, at a federal level on that. And we're seeing a growing recognition that there is a need for more infrastructure. I really feel like in DC, and this is a rare thing to say, uh, outside of Washington, we actually have the wind at our back in terms of leaders in government understanding the need for what you do and the need to get this done quickly, that there's a crisis going on, that there's the demand for spectrum is rapidly exceeding, uh, the demand for wireless data is rapidly exceeding the availability of uh, the carriers to supply it, and that's why we're going so quickly to build this out. We've seen that recognition in the White House, we've seen it at the FCC, we've seen it in Congress, on a bipartisan basis, that there is support for this. Perhaps the most important uh, crowning achievement was in Congress when they passed so-called Section 6409, which allowed for co-location uh, by right and modification of these uh, facilities by right. Uh, that was a huge breakthrough for us, that you don't have to fight every time you want to put a new antenna up on existing facilities with folks. And this is something that was a real bipartisan achievement in Congress. KBLA Hutchinson from, from, um, from Texas, of course, one of the southern states was a key champion uh, of getting that through the Senate. Uh, and we, uh, we, we miss her in Congress. She did a great job for us. But there are a lot of other advocates that continue to support what we do in Congress on a bipartisan basis. Uh, the White House uh, issued an executive order saying we need to accelerate broadband deployment on federal lands. The FCC, on a bipartisan basis, uh, launched a so-called broadband acceleration initiative, which, which uh, led to a good poll attachment rule, which, which helps all of us and provides good pricing. Uh, a shot clock to say that localities can only take so much time before they drag folks out to make a decision, one way or the other, on getting these things cited. And we're fighting that in the Supreme Court today, and we had a positive oral argument on that. And of course, 
more recently, the FCC defined the provisions of Section 6409. They define what it means for co-location. They define what a modification means. So some locality can't say, well, you put a new shrub in, and that's a major modification. We defined it along the lines of what the FCC had already proposed for these things, so that we won't have litigation in every community about what does it mean to do a colo, what does it mean to do a modification. So we are uh, seeing that policymakers in Washington get it, and, and I think there, there's been changes. Uh, we're losing two great champions in the FCC, Commissioner Rob McDowell, uh, who's a Republican member of the commission, announced he's leaving, and shortly thereafter, Chairman Janikowski said he's leaving. Uh, those were great advocates for wireless broadband. Not everybody knows this, but Rob was a good friend of mine when I was on the commission, and Rob McDowell helped to get inserted into the Republican platform some very positive language on wireless infrastructure and how important it is. So that no matter who won that presidential election, we would have been in good shape. But the, the chairman under President Obama, Julius Janikowski, some of you saw him at the PCIA show back in um, Orlando, couldn't have been more supportive of our industry. And the, the steps he's taking, uh, in terms of defining things, in terms of the shot clock, asking us what he can do. We've had some really good advocates, so I don't think it can get any better. I'm hopeful we can continue the, the momentum that we have. We have some good commissioners left that have said good things about um, our industry. But we've gotten all this help from Washington, and we've now, uh, I think, moving the agenda forward. A lot of it's in the states. A lot of it's with the um, state wireless associations. We've seen a lot of successes in the states, uh, and there are a lot of state-level efforts that are underway right now. Uh, PCIA is doing what it can, working with the, the state wireless associations to make sure that we support your advocacy efforts, and we do all that we can to help you do what you do best, which isn't spending your time lobbying like, like, like all of us do, but making sure that your businesses aren't hindered by outdated and vague rules that get in the way of your efforts to efficiently deploy these networks. And we're uh, working closely with all of you to see how we can do that and get these networks built. And we've had a lot of success in the states, and we're going to build on that. In 2012, uh, we saw really great legislation enacted in Michigan, and New Jersey, and Pennsylvania that were models for other states. And this year, we're really redoubling our efforts and in going into more states than we ever have before. Uh, this year in Connecticut, New Hampshire, Missouri, and Washington, there have been bills introduced, uh, and we're currently very active in those states. Those of you from North Carolina, of course, uh, know that PCI and the Carolina's Wireless uh, Association are working on a model ordinance project, and we hope that that can be used effectively in other municipalities around the country. We're seeing in Florida that uh, PCI is working with the Florida Wireless Association, and we've been engaging local decision makers on a lot of ordinances that might um, inhibit rather than promote wireless facility siting. We're making sure that we're, we're educating folks about that so we don't get any setbacks. So even with all the progress that we've made at the federal, state, and local level, we do suffer sometimes setbacks. And uh, I know there's some folks here from Georgia. Some folks here from Georgia tonight? All right. <laughs> great state of, of Georgia. We, of course, you guys did a great job. We heard wonderful reviews from some of the carriers about uh, about uh, your efforts on the mobile broadband infrastructure leads to development or the build act that was moving in the legislature and um, was introduced at the beginning of the, uh, the georgia general assembly's term this year and it proposed comprehensive changes to a uh, georgia law regarding new and co-located wireless facilities i think it would have saved the wireless industry and those in the southern region in particular uh, hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars and it was a real common sense measure and we're pretty hopeful about it, but despite wide support um, and PCIA and the, and the uh, Georgia Wireless Association working uh, hand in glove with AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, and Sprint, conducting outreach, supported the bill, I thought we had a good momentum going. It moved quickly through the committee and the subcommittee and stalled in the House Rules Committee. And why, you know, because I think there's really misconceptions about the bill's impact on zoning authorities for local municipalities. That's right, this bill that would have sped wireless network deployment, something I think everybody in Georgia wants, was stopped in its tracks. And just because lawmakers assumed that it would eliminate local zoning authority. And the committee stripped the bill of a lot of its key provisions in the process. I think they missed an incredible opportunity 
to help combat unnecessary delays and costs. And this type of misunderstanding isn't unique to the Georgia Assembly. It's something that we combat often. It's one of the most difficult hurdles to overcome sometimes. And we'll certainly organize another effort in Georgia. And it's clear that we as an industry have to work together to educate policymakers about uh, what it means to streamline deployment to meet this crushing demand, making the kind of case I talked about. And we'll, we'll do it again in Georgia. We're doing it again in, in a lot of states that you're in. We'll, we'll be continuing to expand as we have victories in some states. We'll move on where you're seeing problems, where the carriers identify problems. We are talking to all of the carriers and trying to come up with a coordinated effort to figure out who wants to go where, when, and what are some of the other state level priorities that the carriers might have so that we can line up well to the state wireless associations and have a united front in the state legislatures. And that's where you all are, I think, so important. If, if there's a secret weapon the PCIA has, it's the state wireless associations. You're really critical. You're the, the boots on the ground that get this job done like no other association in the wireless world has. Uh, and I, I found that when I was back in government, we had a field operation through the Rural Utility Service. It's great to have come aboard an organization. One of the reasons I was so excited about this one was because of all of you, because we had this real committed uh, group. Remember Tip O'Neill used to say all politics are local. Well, you could certainly say the same thing about wireless infrastructure. It has to land somewhere, and that somewhere is very, very local. And those people in that locality are the ones that decide when and where it goes. And we have to make sure that it goes there where it needs to be, and people understand the importance of what it delivers. So our, our, our job, I think, at PCIA, as I have uh, taken the helm there, is to figure out how to improve business opportunities for all of you. You're all seizing that. The folks that are involved in the state wireless associations, I think, are really cutting edge of a lot of uh, the efforts in the states. You're the people who are always thinking about how to get uh, one step ahead, what are the strategies, comparing notes with other states and other people in your state, networking, uh, working uh, to move the agenda forward in the legislature and municipalities. What we can do, I think, at PCIA is, is help, help you because we have strength in numbers. Uh, a lot of you are probably more powerful than you may think. And when we work together, uh, you really can make a huge difference. I think we've seen a lot of great results in a number of states around the country. All advocacy organizations like PCIA, like state wireless associations, exist for two basic reasons either to save businesses money or to help them to make money. And PCIA and the State Wireless Associations are no different. Obviously, you have wonderful networking opportunities like this one uh, that we provide on a regular basis. And like tomorrow's clear shoot, sorry, I can't make it to that. Uh, but uh, there's so many opportunities to meet and work together. Uh, but the, the connections are, are key. Uh, but there's also the ability to have sort of a back office. We at PCIA kind of see ourselves as um, making it easy for you to, to do business and to provide help for the state wireless associations where you're working on a volunteer basis and we try to provide that professional infrastructure that you need to do what you do on a volunteer basis more effectively. And so you don't have to reinvent the wheel in each state or we can take benefits from one state, victories there, try to translate, for example, the Pennsylvania bill in other states. So we want to make it easy for you, whether you're a carrier or an infrastructure provider or services firm or OEM, uh, we've really committed a lot of resources to make sure that the state wireless associations work. I'm not sure people realize this. When I came in, I asked, what have we committed? What have we invested through PCIA in the state wireless associations? And I was staggered by what it's been since their creation, I think, back in 05. Uh, and it, of course, was founded in the South. I think it grew out of Tennessee. Pat Tan and I were talking about some of the early efforts. Uh, this really grew out of this region, one of the reasons you're so advanced. But we at PCI have invested $1.2 million in state wireless associations over that period. For example, we have a full-time uh, director level person that's entirely devoted to supporting your organizations. I think many of you know Nancy Crispin, our, our SWAT director. A lot of you might know, I mean, she's a real industry veteran with over a decade of experience, including uh, a stint with SBA as a business development manager. And we recently uh, welcomed a coordinator to lend even more support, uh, Debbie, uh, Debbie Thompson, right here, who has... She 
has 25 years experience of marketing and communications and uh, she spent the last 17 years of her career as a uh, vice president at, at Bank of America. So we're very lucky to have, have her. Uh, and if you don't know them already, you should get the, uh, take the opportunity to meet them and talk to them and uh, they really bring a wealth of experience. Um, we uh, probably don't have a day that goes by in DC or certainly with, 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 with Nancy and, uh, and Debbie that we don't really interact in a very profound way with all of you in the state wireless associations. We have a top-notch uh, legislative and regulatory team and one of the things that we did, uh, we saw how much energy there was in the State Wireless Association. So we actually hired a full-time attorney to work on uh, state and local issues. He not only conducts policymaker outreach, but also travels out to the states and shares insight and expertise in educational events, answers your calls day and night about this issue or that issue. That's Alex Reynolds right here. Alex, would you stand up so everybody can... Now many of you know Alex and you've got him on your speed dial probably, but if you don't, uh, I urge you to reach out when an issue arises or just introduce yourself to him because you know an issue will arise. Uh, know that we're just a phone call away and that we're putting out a lot of resources to make sure that you can get your job done. And we learn so much from you. You're sort of our eyes and ears out there. When there's an issue, we hear about it first from you. Uh, we can kind of get our, your, our antenna out there and, and uh, it shapes our agenda. When we, we meet, we talk with you, what we hear through Alex and, and Nancy and Debbie, it really decides where we're gonna go, not only on our state and regional efforts, but on the federal level as well. We go to the FCC, we go to Congress, we go to the White House and we say, here's what we're hearing. We give specific examples and you're the ones that provide that. Meetings like this, I think, are really excellent for interacting, but um, when uh, you can't get away from work, you need a way to stay connected, I think, to the state wireless associations. And that's why another example of what we're doing, I'm, I'm really thrilled to unveil a new website here tonight that's designed explicitly for you. Uh, it's uh, statewireless.org, we'll give you that website. But here, for the first time, we're kind of showing you, if you the, uh, this new website. It's a, it's a ready-made platform, really, uh, for communications, offering a variety of ways to connect. There's user forums, blogs, newsletters, and comments that can go through this portal. And it's a portal where you can find information about all the state wireless associations in one place. You can see what other states are doing. And of course, you can focus on your state. It features industry news and an events calendar. And it's a great place for state wireless associations to promote their initiatives. Uh, you'll learn a lot more about uh, statewireless.org and its many capabilities in the coming weeks. We'll be explaining them to you. We're talking to some of the uh, state wireless presidents and VPs tomorrow. I encourage you all to take a uh, visit of this and take advantage of this new interactive website. There's the website right there. I think you'll find it uh, very helpful and, and it will be most helpful to you the more engaged you get, the more engaged we get with you on it. So we've really grown the State Wireless Association. We've grown it to 29 today from its inception uh, in Tennessee and we've created connections and united all kinds of efforts that are happening all across the country and uh, we're set to do even more. So I'm thrilled to be a part of this. I think that we need to continue to provide the types of resources through PCIA and services, and we want to encourage you to continue to participate and, uh, and support this and commit any resources you can, uh, committee calls, uh, other resources. To make this sustainable, we want to, uh, to really have a good back and forth uh, with all of you. Uh, we have our show, of course, coming up in, um, in October in Hollywood near Miami, Florida. Uh, might be a little little warmer than it is here today. Uh, but uh, we, we uh, really are the, are the home of, of getting wireless networks built. And you're the people that actually get it done. So as our membership expands, our voice becomes, I think, even more powerful. We've had a great year in terms of developing new members. We've got uh, Alka Lucent joined, and Qualcomm, and Motorola, and, Boingo and 16 other companies have, have joined our new, new members have joined PCIA. So we're going from cable companies to carriers, OEMs, infrastructure, pure play Wi-Fi providers. We're really stronger together, all of us who are in this business of building uh, wireless uh, networks. Uh, we are, are going to get this done because the country is demanding it. Uh, policymakers are increasingly getting it. We're the ones who are going to explain that to them. 